I know it's been a while since I posted any YouTube content, but a lot of stuff has been happening in my life over the last few years, including the purchase of a grown-up toolbox. Now, like many DIYers, I've amassed an assortment of hand tools, but I also have a pretty extensive background in aviation tooling, so in my case, these jumbled tools are an inexcusable hypocrisy. I need to get these organized. And for that task, shadow boards are definitely my weapon of choice. Shadow boards are storage devices that have cutouts for every item in the overall inventory. They're very effective at highlighting missing items, and they make post-work cleanup much easier. But they're also hard to build, and they get outdated if you add any new tools to your collection. For simple profiles, like a socket, the workflow is pretty straightforward. Use the circle function in your favorite CAD software to design a hole, feed that into your computer-controlled cutting tool of choice, and just like that, you have a shadow board. Now, unfortunately, very few tools have such accommodatingly simple shapes. When I need more than just a few measurements, I pull out my old office bench. I made this thing years ago when I needed both seating and storage in my office, and since then I've modified it a little bit. Now, one end of this thing has a small computer that controls a camera. The other has a backlit stage that provides nice lighting for your tools. Or your fruit. I won't judge. I'll get into how it works shortly, but I do want to show a quick example of the full process. My bench starts with a photograph, which it processes into a geometry file that I can feed into my CAD software. The computer's guess gets me 98% of the way to my design, but more often than not I do need to tweak the output shape just a bit before I can send it to my CNC for cutting. I can't claim that I've got this process perfected, but what I have does work, and it's definitely orders of magnitude faster than attempting to design each shape from scratch. Alright, that first example was rushed, so I'll slow down and go into more detail. This contraption is a plywood box, and I did not have shadow boards in mind when I built it. One end has a string of LEDs and a diffuser. The other has a Raspberry Pi computer, camera, power supply, monitor, input buttons, and some voltage converters. And yes, I'm well aware that my wire routing and soldering skills need a little help. Just bear with me, I'm still learning. Once the stage is lit, I place the tool into it and press the red button to fire the camera. My script uses the Pi Camera library, which is headed for obsolescence, so I'll be rewriting my script when the Python bindings for LibCamera get released. Just having a picture of the tool isn't enough. I, I need to edit it before it becomes something that I can feed into my CAD software. The first step being to compensate for my camera's barrel distortion. Well, what is barrel distortion, you may ask? Well, have a look at this photograph. Do you notice how the edge of my workbench looks arched? I don't have a curved workbench. What you're seeing is barrel distortion in the image. Fortunately, the team over at OpenCV has an undistort module that I can plug into my Python script. You see it working? That's important because I need straight lines to appear straight in the final product. After undistorting the photo, a crop function helps disguise the fact that I didn't do any math before randomly picking the lens for this project. Now that the image has been tweaked to suit my process, I'd need to separate which bits of the image represent my tool and which ones are just part of the background. And unfortunately for that to make sense, we need to talk about the data in a digital photograph. Now it might sound intimidating, but it's actually fairly simple. So here goes. This is a rather tranquil scene of a meadow. But if I were to really, really zoom in on one of the sheep, eventually the image would look like this. Close up, you can see that a digital image is just a lot of little colored squares placed next to each other. Those squares are called pixels, and there's about two million of them in this entire image. Every pixel in an image has a color, and like many other things in life, there's multiple methods for characterizing said colors. In fact, there's a good argument that the hue, saturation, and light parameters might work better for my workflow than the technique that I'm about to present. Regardless, my script relies on analysis of the red, green, and blue values of each pixel. That still seems to get the job done. Each of these colors, or channels, can range in value from 0 to 255. For example, a pixel with all three channels maxed out will be white, and conversely, zeros in all three channels will produce a black pixel. If you extend this logic and max out one of the channels, say the red one, then the resulting pixel will be red. And if you pick random values for all three channels, you get one of about 13 million different color combinations. This particular one appears to be sort of a cocoa brown. Here's another way to look at those different color combinations. It's a cube. One side of the cube shows the red scale, another the green, and the third shows the blue scale. To show some points that are internal to the cube, I'm depicting it as a translucent solid with colors at the eight corners, but it actually represents all of the different RGB color combinations. Remember that example of the cocoa brown color? That would be located right about here on this cube. And for my script, there are two very important points on this cube. The black corner, where red, green, and blue are all zero, and the white, where those three values are maxed out. Because I backlit the tool as it was being photographed, all the pixels that represent the tool are going to be relatively close to the black corner. 
The opposite is true for pixels that represent areas outside of the tool's profile. Those will be closer to the white corner. This means that I can split the RGB cube and reassign each pixel in my tool photograph a new value based on which zone the original pixel occupied. And the result is going to be a new photograph that contains only two colors. At this point in the workflow, I still have a pixelated image. That means it's really no good to my CAD software in its current form. However, Peter Selinger wrote an amazing piece of software called Potrace, which can convert a bitmap image into various vector formats. Calling Potrace from my Python script turns the picture into something that my CAD software can digest. Everything that I just described happens every time I hit the red button. All I need to do now is cycle through every tool in the drawer. When the final tool has been scanned, the blue button compiles all the photos into a single vector file and sends it to a thumb drive. I'm only going to produce one or two drawers in this video, so now I can put my gizmo back into regular bench mode again. Now I'm working on a regular desktop PC, and this is what all those tools outlines look like when initially imported to my CAD software. They're just stacked one on top of the next, and I like to start from one end of the stack and work my way through the whole inventory. You can see where I'll need to clean up some of these shapes. And it's quite possible that tweaking some settings on my camera and my Python script would improve the quality of these shapes. Well, what I have right now will still work just fine. A word of warning in case you want to try this for yourself, it's really easy to go down rabbit holes while optimizing these tool shapes. Uh, I know that I've caught myself chasing perfection a time or two and I need to force myself to stop editing when the shape is plain old good enough for a shadow board. For the shapes that need to be edited, I try to invest less than a minute per tool. Once I get a shape that I like, I try to separate each tool into a family or a group. There's really no science here, no right or wrong way to organize your tools. And when I'm done, I start to get a feel for how my drawer is going to look. And I can ask myself important questions like, do I really need 22 sets of pliers? Yes, yes I do. I didn't time myself, but these two drawer designs are the product of somewhere between two and three hours of work. Now, it only took 15 minutes to hit that red button 71 times, and the remainder of the time was spent editing shapes and laying out the drawers. And now that I have a 2D layout that I like, I'm going to switch software and design that third dimension. I'm working in Fusion 360 now, and like CamBam, it has both CAD and CAM capabilities, but the two software are very different. That said, I do think they complement each other very nicely. In Fusion 360, I can take CamBam's 2D output and revisualize it in three dimensions. I can also touch up the design by adding finger holes and adjust the depths of various pockets. The depicted material is a little unusual for a toolbox. It's co-extruded high-density polyethylene, and I happen to work in a factory where it's produced. You've likely seen it before. It's used in playground equipment and outdoor signs. And in this material family, the orange and black color scheme is my favorite combination, and I think it's going to look really sharp in my toolbox. It's not for everyone. I know that I'd never use it in a toolbox that was going to go into some sort of professional production environment. But this is my personal toolbox, so I'll use whatever color I want. I'd also like to thank Vicon Plastics for allowing me to use this material for my project. I wasn't given permission to take this scrap just because I had an application at home. Rather, my employer recognized that this video is me sharing skills that I picked up earlier in life, and they're supporting this attempt to share my knowledge with the rest of the world. And by the way, if you want some of this material, you can get started by heading to Vicom's website. I'll put a link in the video description. This project was done using our Playboard line, but we make all sorts of fun stuff. Direct retail sales isn't really our thing, but if you click on the Find the Distributor link, somebody on our customer service team will get you pointed in the right direction. I would love to jump right into some footage of carving up these shadow boards, but that's only going to happen if I can keep this HDPE fastened to the bed of my machine. I already have a spoil board that's about the right size, so relieving 10 pockets on the back of that spoil board is going to allow me to fix this stock in place with a bunch of spring clamps. With those pockets cut out, I can flip my spoil board back over and screw it to the bed of my CNC. Then I can assess my raw material, which is just a little bit too long to run in its current form. That's easily rectified by a trip to the bandsaw, and then I'm all set up to clamp this material in place for cutting. The first cut on the CNC is just a shallow outline of the overall board shape. It's a sanity check to make sure that my stock is large enough, my design is centered, and the tool won't collide with any of my clamps, which is a mistake that I've totally made before, multiple times. And now I can start cutting tool shape pockets. I'm starting with a half-inch end mill to increase my material removal rate, and that's just a fancy term for hogging out a lot of material as quickly as possible. 
Now eventually the nooks and crannies in these detailed pockets will require me to switch over to a small tool, but getting started with a relatively large end mill is going to save me at least two hours of cutting time. I could probably push this tool a little faster, but I'm also limited by my machine. I love it very much. I, I built it from scratch, mostly following Michael Simpson's KRMX01 plans, and it's been a great machine to learn on. But I've outgrown it, and I need to either buy a new machine or put a lot of time into upgrading this one. Consequently, I'm not pushing this tool as fast as I'd like. Also, I need to finish hooking up my dust collection. I'm doing my best to contain these chips in my shop, but some will inevitably get tracked into the house, and my wife will not be happy. Once I finish with a half inch end mill, I can swap it out for a quarter inch end mill. The quarter inch toolpaths don't take very long, and soon enough I'm ready to swap down to the eighth inch end mill, and eventually cut out the perimeter of the shadow board. The second shadow board is cut pretty much the same way, although I decided to ditch the quarter inch end mill and go from the half inch to the eighth inch cutter. Actually, let's talk about those cutters for a second, specifically their designs. The big end mill is an upcut flute design, and I think it's a good choice for the roughing operations because it flings chips away from the workpiece. I mean, they're all over my shop now, but at least they're not stuffed into the previously cut areas of the shadow board. The downside of an upcut end mill is that it leaves a ragged edge on the top of the cut, but that's why the finishing cutter, this uh, little eighth inch end mill, is a down cut design. Instead of pulling the chips out of the cut, it's pushing them down, and consequently it does a great job of shearing off those ragged edges that the larger end mill left behind. Anyhow, while I was distracting you with those fun facts about cutting tool geometry, my CNC finished cutting out that second shadow board. And at this point, I'm done with the cutting, and I'm ready to install these boards in my toolbox. The boards snap in easily, and they're a good fit for the space, well, from front to back, but I could have made them just a tick wider. Oh well, I'll remember that for the next drawer. Anyhow, it's time to start putting tools into their final homes, and I know exactly which one I'm going to start with. Now, I say this with all the love in the world, but, honey... From now on, that little tool for opening paint cans it goes right here. And that's pretty much it. This is the first time that I've been able to shadow my own toolbox, but it's hardly my first experience with this process, so allow me to get a little philosophical. If you're looking to organize some collection of tools, I'd really encourage you to set your sights higher than a piece of foam and a razor knife. I know that not everybody is going to want to build the gear that you just saw me operating, but you can absolutely generate your own digital files with a cell phone camera and some open source software like Inkscape. And if you don't have any CNC cutting tools, then there are websites like 100,000garages.com that can hook you up with hobbyist CNC operators that will cut your material for a reasonable fee, especially if you provide the material. There are professional foam cutting vendors out there, and I've used a few. But the economics of a pro shop usually don't work out unless you need them to crank out a couple dozen identical kits. Also, pro shops own the design at the end of the job, and that can become an issue because tool inventories aren't permanent. They change over time. And owning your design will give you a lot of options in a few years when it's time to add more shapes and cut new boards. You just watched me make two basic shadow boards for my pliers and screwdrivers, but I didn't touch my sockets and wrenches in this video. And oddly enough, those are typically the tools that most people start with when they shadow their tool collections. I'll work on that drawer next, and that'll be its own project because there are some additional considerations that come into play when you're shadowing wrenches and sockets. Nothing mind-blowing, but there are some design trade-offs. Whether or not I film the next project sort of depends on the response that I get to this video. It's fair to say that it took more time to edit this video than it took to build the shadow board, so let me know if it was worth the effort by leaving a comment and subscribing. I really like getting feedback on my videos, and I try to answer as many comments as I can. If it seems like the DIY community would like to follow this project, I'll keep filming. And if you're still with me, thanks so much for watching the entire video, and I really hope to see you on my next project.